Hi, and welcome to another online Bible study with Pastor Bill Brown, Carmichael Baptist Church. This is kind of continuing on with our preparation for a solemn assembly. We've talked about prayer. Uh, we had prayer 101. This is going to be worship 101. We've talked about fasting, and then we talked about fasting and prayer. So we're just going to give some basics about worship, and then we're going to enlarge on that whole thing uh, and this subject uh, on Sunday. So we're going to continue. We'll be looking at the worship in a solemn assembly and kind of get a peek back into what Israel did. Uh, looking at their feast and the days, the sacrifices, the offerings, and then they concluded with that solemn assembly. Well, what did that involve, and how did these other things lead up to this? All of these sacrifices, offerings, the thing they did pointed towards Christ. Even the law, Paul said, was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Well, I don't want to get too far on that, uh, away from that. I want to give you, I should say, I don't want to get too far away from our concept of Worship 101. I did a series back in June of last year, so about a year and a half ago, and talked about worship in about seven different services. Um, and this is kind of a combination summary, not all of it, but part of it here that we're going to look at and then December 12th, again, we'll focus our attention on the solemn assembly and the worship that's there. Um, in this, we want to look at, again, how that man has a tendency, and remind us of this, of man has a tendency to take anything that God teaches us about, and he begins to put an overemphasis on the outward or the fleshly experience, if I can say it that way, or the mechanical participation that we might involve in a ceremony or a service. That happens a lot of times. So even it happened to the Jews and, and it became mechanical. It was so with the Apostle Paul before God saved him. And when Christ encountered a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, he began to teach her about this transitionary period of going from Old Testament to New Testament and how it would affect the form of worship. Wouldn't affect the center of worship. Wouldn't affect who or how you worship or even where you worship. Not in the sense of what's central and spiritual in the lesson. So we're going to begin to look at... Uh, the biblical guidelines, that was one of the headings in our original series. How does the Bible guide us in worship and in doing so? We don't want to focus in on the laws of the do's and the don'ts, but we want to get an idea. For instance, notice in John chapter 4, again, where Jesus was talking to this Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. And she was like, well, you Jews, you worship over here and you do this. And he said, listen, woman, believe me. The hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. So location is not going to be the significant part anymore. But he's, it's still going to be something that he's designated. You're not going to worship in Jerusalem. You're not going to worship the Father. And he says, you worship, you know not what. We know what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is... When the true worshiper shall worship the Father, here's your how in spirit and in truth. There was the who as well. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. That was so true even for Israel back when they had all the laws, the ceremonies, the days. Because again, every one of those, the sacrifices, the offerings, pointed towards Jesus Christ. But Jesus is here saying there are some things that are going to change. There's going to be a change in the form. But we're going to kind of look back at what stayed the same so we can notice the difference also in the form. Real worship has certain components from Old Testament to New, from prior to the Old Testament all the way to the New. 
So we're going to see these biblical backgrounds, and we're going to notice that I already kind of pointed out the who. Who do we worship? God the Father. That's it. That hasn't changed. That never changed from the very beginning. Before man ever fell, he walked with God in the cool of the evening. We stand, we publicly gather, we sing, we preach, we teach, we practice the ordinances, and we transact the business of the kingdom, but we do it all to the glory and to the honor of our God. We worship Jehovah God. That's just what Israel did. The who hasn't changed. Even the how hasn't changed. Just like I just said, we stand, we gather, we sing, we pray, we preach, we teach, we practice. That's what they did. They carried out the business of the kingdom. The only difference is that now we worship in spirit. Well, Yes, they had all those mechanical devices, but everyone were pointing to Jesus Christ and teaching them the spiritual application of being born again, of having a relationship with God, of understanding that. In fact, even when we look at, not well, let me go one more because we also want to see the where. Where is it? Not in this mountain, nor at, yet at Jerusalem. Well, it's got to be somewhere. Even the people are going to be somewhat changed in a way as far as the material. So the who, the how, and the where are going to change forms, but it's still going to be worship of Jehovah God. We're still going to worship in spirit and truth because you can remember how many times Israel would be worshiping God. And he said, you're doing all these things, but your heart is far from me. And then the where at that time, it was at Jerusalem. It was in the mountain. But come later, as this transition takes place, as it already has taken place, it's going to be in spirit. Anywhere and anywhere where God has a designated people. We'll look at that a little bit later. But in this how... Let me talk a little bit about two, clear those out, and look at some words from the Hebrew that give kind of a, a highlight um, of maybe some, there are in these words overlap and combinations that are here, but they really give us a sense of the spiritual activity that should take place. You can't manufacture spirit. You are either excited or you're not. You're either enlightened or you're not. You're either ready to praise God or you're not. But that's part of where our heart should be. That's the word halal. That's the word hallelujah or praise. And included in that too is the idea of sing. Uh, to sing hallelujahs. To sing is that shirah. I don't know how to pronounce that to be honest with you. Um, there's the word rejoice which is to make merry, to brighten up. It isn't to be just a somber service, but an encouraging service. We also see the word joyful used. Joyful is the word to be exceedingly joyful. You know, it even carries with it the idea of spinning, how somebody gets excited, they can't stand still. Well, that goes right along with our next word, dance. How about that? in the movement and basically having to do with the singing and the instruments that are going on we're moved our worship may be that we are just simply so excited raising our hands lifting our voices in song or moving with the music um, that we have and there are some other words that are a combination of these one is uh, sing praises and this has to do with singing praises on instruments the word Hebrew word zamar again I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly but it means to play praise on musical instruments the word be joyful um, that's the word to exalt to delight to revel in God to glory in God Weird word to gloat in God, how grateful he is. And then to sing aloud. 
<coughs> we sing praises. We sing with the instruments and we sing aloud. We cry out. We shout with our voices. Great joy unto the Lord. Excuse me, gonna have to <coughs> let me get a little sip from that COVID cough, right? No, I don't have that. Praise the Lord. <coughs> <coughs> but I still have allergies. Well, listen. Now, let's get back to the where. I had mentioned that, but I said that it, from that verse, you can see it's not going to be in the mountain. It's not going to be in Jerusalem. So then where is it going to be? Well, I believe that when we look through the scriptures without me going into great detail, that we worship, and this is what hasn't changed, in the place designated by God. Now, where's that today? I believe that today is in the New Testament church. Now, I, I believe that originally it was in the family. The father was to be the priest. And he was to lead the family. Then it became the nation. Israel was chosen, given the oracles of God. That's where the temple and the tabernacle was built. That's where they were to come and to really the central place of worship. But now where is it? Look at where it is in Ephesians 3 and 21. He says, unto him be glory. Glory in the church. That's talking about the local assembly. Oh, I'm sorry for those of you who have been taught too much Protestant theology and think of the church as the family of God. Change that thinking. The family of God, there's the family of God, there's the kingdom of God, and there's the church of God. The church is the local assembly and institution that Christ uh ordered, organized, and built on this earth in his own ministry while he was here. And it's unto him that glory is given to God in the church, how by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. Christ came, he established his church, his assembly, and that's where we ought to worship. Now, even that has changed somewhat in the fact that when it first began, Primarily, all of the believers, the baptized believers that were there, that were coming together to fulfill the Great Commission, were all Jews. But soon, these churches, because others are going to be established, these churches would be filled with Gentiles. And that's really going to change the form and format of worship and who can worship and how they are to worship. You need to know the worship is not offered by only one na nation, one nationality, one color, or one gender, or it's according to your age or educational level or some special knowledge, or maybe even you think that it's only for just some who don't practice certain things and do practice other things. You see, the church, and that's why we look at that, the Bible guidelines gives us the where in the New Testament. The primary place of worship is in the New Testament church, and the church is composed of born-again, baptized believers who have covenanted together to express their common faith, their dedication, and practice their lives according to the way of Jesus Christ. Worship, of course, we know now, concentrates on the spiritual the spiritual, even in a church, must regulate the physical, never the other way around. The means of our worship is always through Jesus Christ, which is going to make it be spiritual. The church, though an earthly institution, again, was began by Christ and is ruled by Christ and is at the center of our worship services. In fact, you can't even, biblical guidelines, you can't even be in the kingdom unless you're already born again. So that's kind of where we go to next as far as the boundaries of worship. The first boundary is that you must be born again. You have to know Jesus Christ. Only the saved can truly worship God. Now, others can come and get themselves right the same way we did in being saved. But understand this, that salvation is of the Lord, but worship begins in the heart of those who have been born again. 
not only salvation, but the boundaries are the sacredness of worship. It's important, for instance, to go back to the time of Moses. And he was told what? when the presence of the Lord was there in that burning bush, he told him, Moses, take off your shoes for this is sacred ground. We need to remember that worship is for those who are saved. We have been sanctified. We have been set apart and worship is sacred because we're coming together to worship God. We're coming together to praise him and to thank him to pray to him, to sing unto him. And look, where two or three are gathered together in the midst, uh, there am I in the, I can't even say, gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. That makes our gathering sacred. That's the where. But two, we see that it's not only sacred, it's spiritual. If you remember this, again, you can't worship without knowing Christ. Worship is be, to be treated as a sacred place. It's wherever God has designated for you to gather. But also, it has to do, like I said, spiritual. It has to do with your motives. Uh, there were, uh, there was a couple in the book of Acts by the name of Ananias and Sapphira who came to find out about a boundary that God put in worship, a boundary of purpose. Why are you here? What are you doing? If you have the wrong reasons, you may end up getting yourself into some trouble. All worship must be directed towards God and be in truth. It, you're not there for selfish reasons, nor for untruthful purposes, which is what they did. They wanted to make themselves to appear greater than they were, and they lied. God struck them down and killed them right in that service. And great fear came upon the church. Well, amen to that. Tells you, you better be right when you're there. Worship is not for the activities of personal pleasure, personal enrichment, or personal praise. That's man-centered worship. Worship is not about you. It's about God. It has to be God-centered Worship is designed to express the truth that we have a changed heart. In fact, worship is designed to show that we have a desire to be in his presence. It ought to be something to show forth that we are resting in his power. And it ought to be our worship should be that we are expressing our hope in his purpose. God has a purpose. Number one, you think about it, he promised to be in our midst. So pray and sing for that desire that God would truly be in our midst. He promises that the power of the blood of Jesus Christ can wash away all sin and brings peace and rest. Rest in that fact. Thank the Lord for it. Appreciate him. Adore him for what he has done. And pray that others that you know might come to know that same truth that you do by his grace and mercy. We ought to worship God in making known our reconciliation that's taken place by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that God has given us life and that others can have this life too. We ought to pray that we see God's wonder, that we are participants and observers of his amazing grace and his abundant mercy. We ought to praise him for our redemption, for our pardon, and for our coming perfections. We praise God that one of these days we have a hope in his purpose that these bodies are going to go in the grave and we will be clothed with a body not made with hands. We'll have a glorified body like his. We want to see his glory in its fullness. I'd like to see, and I know you would too, and we can pray together that God would show his glory in us and to us and through us. 
Lastly, just let me make a little mention of the people of worship. Now, I already mentioned uh, this in other forms and as we went through this, but just to say very clearly that we ought to know when we read in the scriptures and when we see it around us that the people of worship are a people of faith. We're talking about the fact that we believe God and we believe in Jesus Christ and we believe that God has raised him from the dead. We believe that his blood is the cleansing power to reconcile us and to make us at one with our God, to justify us. And our faith in him is unwavered in that. We profess our faith in him. We are a people of faith. We'll sing of that faith. We'll talk of that faith. And we'll also show that the people of worship, the real worship of God, and the real people of worship are a people of courage and commitment. You think about the Apostle Paul, Peter, James, and others who were willing to lose their liberty and even their lives rather than to comply with government control and deny their faith in Jesus Christ as the only hope and the only savior. My dear friend, it goes not only into the New Testament, we see that, but into the first, second, and third century and on beyond that. Even up into the 1400s, we can look back through some of the books that we have, the history books, and find that there were those who would not be moved and were burned at the stake for their faith. Imagine that. They were a people of faith. They were a people of courage and commitment. People who worship are that you, the kind that's of great courage, then come and worship. Who we look and we find they were a people of humility. Kind of like that man that Jesus talks about, that it says it, in fact, he contrasts the Pharisee who says, I thank thee, O God, that I'm not like them other men. You know, I'm so much better. That's not humble. Or was the other man the one who went home just, that wouldn't even come up close? that stood in the back, that bowed his head and smote his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Oh, that's the man. That humble man went home justified. That's the people who are called to come and worship, a people who know they are not worthy to stand before and praise and sing and pray unto a holy and a righteous God. But we know that we have been made trophies of his grace through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Then lastly, these are a people who exalt God. They exalt God and not themselves. We do not worship and come to worship in order to manage God. I hope that makes sense to you. In fact, we don't come in order to manage God. We come in order that God might manage us, that he might work in us, that he might work through us. Not that we would influence him, but that he would greatly influence us. When I look through all the things that I've looked at with worship, I can see that worship is certainly showing reverence and adoration to God. That's both an attitude and an act. And that is something that comes from the heart and from the soul. Worship is bowing before God, lowering ourselves before the sovereign Savior of the universe. If the heart is not bowed in matters of this kind, if the heart is not bowed, it doesn't matter whether your body is bowed or not. If you think about worship, Abraham brings something to mind there when 
he told the two as he was taking his son up to offer him as a sacrifice. And he told the two servants that were with him to stay while I and my son go on to worship. And then a little bit later it says, upon seeing the holiness and the glory of God, said he ran and he bowed himself before him every before he began to speak. When you look at Isaiah, upon seeing the holiness and the glory of God that shook everything of that doorpost, what did he do? He saw his own condition. I am a man of unclean lips. And he saw the condition of his people. I am a man of people who are unclean lips. But you and I, even though we come with unclean lips, they do not remain such. We're like that angel who took the, the fire, the coals from off of the altar and placed them upon Isaiah's mouth and cleansed it that he might give thanksgiving to God the same way that now we can. Hebrews talks about it in Hebrews 13 verses 15 and 16 where he says, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of God, or of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Take time from your day, from your labors and your pleasures and give honor unto the Lord. Come and worship him. Sing, pray, and praise. Think about we're nothing but sinners and now God has made us saints and allowed us to come and worship him. Think about that we were once the ungodly and the unrighteous and yet God has shown us mercy, he saved us, he's cleansed us. He's made us sons, not slaves. He's made us righteous and reconciled through Jesus Christ. Oh my goodness, can you see the mercy that was poured upon you? Are we not then being made ready to be merciful to others who do not deserve that mercy? I think about the Apostle Paul and Silas beaten, put into prison for their faith. But though they were beaten and thrust in the inner prison and their feet were put, held fast into the stocks, it says they sang praises unto the Lord and prayed. You know what else? Someone was saved as a result of that. Lord, use our worship to affect the lives of others. Encourage them, direct them, deliver them. But most of all, receive all the glory and honor of our worship and put a new song in our mouth. Let me read from Psalm 101. A Psalm of David, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. Prepare for worship. Are you excited? Are you ready to even set the time for our solemn assembly and to come and participate? I pray you will. Let's worship God together. Lord bless you.